I live in the Arctic part of Canada. I live in the capital city of that province now. But as a kid, I was raised in the sticks, out in the woods. And mostly, I was by myself. I knew forests, and I knew what's normal. And there is something living in my grandfather's woods that is not normal. I'm too chicken to find out what it is, though. My grandfather, Philip, I called him Puppy, but everyone else called him Phil, passed two years ago last January, just after his 73rd birthday. He had been in a care home for the last three years, but the last few months were the hardest. My grandfather was my best friend when I was a little boy. He was a huge man with a big red nose, no hair, and brilliant sapphire blue eyes. He dressed well and loved the color pink. He constantly wore pink and even painted the inside of his house, which he built himself, pink. He wasn't my blood grandfather. That was Duncan, who ended his own life in 74. I never met Duncan, but he's not really a part of this story. My grandmother Emma met Phil as a young widow. She didn't know anything about him. She soon learned that he was intelligent, a brother to four younger siblings, and owned a large amount of property in a different part of the area. He made money by working for the town, digging and paving roads and the like. He and my nan, a fiery chick, with no time for anything she didn't want, hit it off. She had three kids with her dead husband, my mother and two uncles. Philip was good with the kids, but never ever let them come around his place. Only Nan was allowed, until I was born. I was born in 92, and had out of spite, but my grandfather loved me for some reason, and treated me like I was his own. Constantly paid attention to me. He was really only one of two people that actually cared for me. My mother was negligent and self-involved constantly passing me off to other people, other family members. I barely remember a good exchange with my mother as a child. I really only remember playing in the woods. My grandfather and grandmother never married, and my grandfather never had any marriages before that, nor any children. Once in a while, myself and my grandmother would make the hour long or so drive to go spend the day at my grandfather's place. He owned a huge chunk of family land, not unlike my family's own, just not on the coast. It was off a winding river that the nearest village was named after. It was family land, however the original family home had been swallowed up by a massive flood after my grandfather inherited it as a young man. The family home is still presently underwater, having collapsed long before I ever had a chance to see it. Instead, my granddad built a new home and a few maintenance properties around it. He left the new lake where it stood, let the old homestead fall into the water and never spoke about it. When I stayed with my grandfather, with my grandmother for visits, he would teach me things, lots of useful down home things, how to plant and grow veggies, what kind of things were edible from the forest, how to boil water and clean it, what tracks meant which kind of animals were near, the sounds of foxes and coyotes across the lake were nothing to fear, what kind of trees were around us, how to raise chickens and pigs for food, and treat them with respect, things like that. Just wisdom. But he also taught me that birch trees scream when the wind blows, and if I were to hear that steady, gut-wrenching shriek, and the wind wasn't blowing to go home right away. That the smell of rotting meat generally meant danger and to not to walk off the trail. Also, to never stay out past dark, especially if I were near the camp or on the surrounding trail. That the old rusty scythe in the oak tree, so old that it had grown into the branches and fused there, unmovingly and vaguely threatening, was for protection. If you look on screen, you can see the Google satellite images. As before, there were none in the area. I've outlined a lot of them to help with my explanation of the summer. I was seven years old. This is the main property my grandfather owned. 
all of the woods between the roads that you see there, as well as a lot of the acres surrounding. Notice the lack of other buildings and trails. It's all woods. This will give you a better idea of the visible surrounding area. The neighbours outlined in yellow were always strangers to me. I never knew the constant revolving door of people that rented the property. No one ever stayed more than a few months. I remember several of them losing dogs and cats over the years. Pets had a hard time surviving there. You would often find dogs after the coyotes got them. Sometimes left in trees or on doorsteps. Sometimes in the backs of the cars in my grandfather's car graveyard. The blue property was that of the grandfather's only nephew, Kenneth. Kenneth was a very normal guy with a wife that was an elementary school teacher a few towns over. They weren't often home as they had no children. This is my grandfather's property, including his home. This is the walking trail that I would often follow to reach the camp, which was off the main property. And this is the camp property, including the pet graveyard. The summer I turned seven years old of 98, my mother decided to drive out to my grandfather's without asking if he was there. She'd never been to the property and didn't know the way. I remember her getting lost several times, trying to find the McKay Road. She finally arrived, and I remember my grandfather being completely startled by us appearing at his home. I had never been there without my grandmother, and as it turns out, she was out of town and unable to come down to look after me. But once again, my mother wouldn't take no for an answer and left me with my granddad without much of a second thought. Night was falling as my grandfather was nervous, is the only way I could describe it. It was remarkably still, summer night, but he was agitated, chasing the chickens into the barn that they stayed in, making sure the cats were locked in the shop with the yearling pigs we'd been raising. I watched him through the mudroom window, standing on tiptoes to watch him stop to occasionally draw a handkerchief against his forehead, sweating in the dull, thick summer heat. I remember hearing the rising cries of the peepa and bullfrogs from the lake. We were so close that often they'd become cacophonous and really the only thing you'd hear that summer with the clean air. They were particularly loud. I loved that sound more than I can ever admit. It still brings back the good memories. Finally, a little before full dark, he came in and made us a small dinner of venison and potatoes. We went to bed shortly after that. I thought it was strange because usually he and I would stay up and watch old Western movies or something on television, but he explained that he was tired and early nights are good for people. So I went to the spare room. The house he built had been simple. One floor with crawl space and no attic. There was really only five rooms in total. A mud room with a large washing tub and an ice box. It held the only door to the outside. It opened into the kitchen and that led into an open concept living room, just up from the kitchen and attached to it was his bedroom and a small bathroom and the spare room, almost in a T shape, with the bathroom at the axis of the T and the bedrooms on either end of the stop stroke. There were a few windows, one of which was in his room facing the front porch, and another that was just above the head of the bed in the spare room, with another along the bed's left flank. I laid in that familiar bed, in the loud silence of the croaking and twiping frogs roaring through the open screened window, and finally I fell asleep. It was early, early morning, 2.48 to be exact, because from my soon vantage point, I would see the clock blaring down on us. I don't know what happened first. I think I was still waking up, so I became aware of two things at once. One, that my grandfather was yanking me off the bed and onto the wood floor alongside the left side of the bed, or two, that someone was knocking incessantly on the door. My grandfather was huge compared to me, and he laid down basically on top of me and put his huge callous hand over my mouth and hushed me with the other. I remember how pale he looked in the moonlight, 
His eyes were dinner plates and he looked very much like a frightened child. It was then that I realized the frogs had gone silent. The knocking continued. Loud, insistent, done in a pattern of threes, with short, impatient pauses in between. Then I heard a voice, very hauntingly calm and distant, coming from the front of the tiny house. Philip. I looked at my grandfather. Utterly no one called him Philip. Everyone, everyone called him Phil. He hated being called Philip. Right up until he passed. Philip, it's me, your nephew, Kenneth. That's when I started to get very frightened. I never really knew fear like that. But hearing that voice, that weirdly clear emotionless voice, call my grandfather by that wrong, wrong name, and then tell us that it was his nephew, Kenneth? Kenneth with the jolly face and booming country voice, and the charmingly misspelt name. Whatever it was that knocked on the house itself wasn't him. I could hear it tap the glass of my grandfather's bedroom window, once again calling for him in that clean crystal voice. Philip, it's me, Kenneth, your nephew. Let me in. I heard the whatever it was, step down off the porch after a moment or two, then start walking, following the side of the house. My grandfather held his breath, pressing down harder over the top of me and covering most of my eyes with his palm, hushing me again. I could barely see the blue of the screen above me, but I could hear perfectly well. It walked a slow, even pace unhurried completely. However, it did stop once at the bottom window, knocking again. Philip. It called. Then it stopped, right at the screen above us. I couldn't see it, but I could see something blocking out the bluish light. I could hear something, taking slow, even breaths. Then something dark pressed against the screen. And I remember being so terrified that I couldn't take a breath. Philip, I know you're in there. It's me, your nephew. Let me in. We stayed there, in a standoff for so long my body had bruises from the floor. Us trapped on the ground, and it standing behind the screen. Finally, after so long, I got dizzy from holding my breath. It just left, leading that even easy pace back against the side of the house and then out, gone as quickly and as without a warning as it had came. My grandfather waited a while longer, slowly and cautiously stood up and put me back into bed. He didn't say a word, but closed the window before returning to sit in the darkness of the kitchen. Slowly, the sound of the frogs returned, and at some point when the light of morning finally started peeking through the windows, I fell asleep. The next morning I awoke to the sound of the ATV being pulled out of the barn. I got up in a hurry, still sore from being pressed onto the floor and ran for the front door only to catch my grandfather pulling out of the car park and heading towards the forest trail. He was pulling a small cart behind him and taking things easy. I had plenty of time to see the blue industrial tarp laying over the back of the cart. I pulled on a pair of boots and went outside, hoping to at least see where he was going, and ended up next to the barn shop, or barn I suppose. The big oak where the scythe had been overgrown in its bows had its roots right besides the thresher, parked besides the barn. I stood beside it. Then I don't really know what made me look up, but I was met with my pig, the yearling we raised, 
staring blankly down at me from a new perch beside the scythe. My grandfather had butchered the pig, taken its body into the forest, and just left the head in the tree. I didn't scream, but I wanted to. I wanted to so badly. I felt my throat compress in stunned, terrified silence. For the next day, my grandfather pretended to not know what I was talking about when I asked where he'd gone and where the pig had gone. He pretended that nothing had happened the night before. We ate lunch and dinner that went to bed early. The night was uneventful. The next morning, however, I went outside. I think I was still operating on autopilot. And as I stepped outside of the door, I didn't quite understand what I was looking at. Below the oak, the one with my pig in it. It looked like someone had left a pile of green leaves. As I stepped closer, it became clearer. The pig's head was gone completely and had been replaced with a pale green moth's wings. Lunar moth wings. Tons of them. Just laying there. But no bodies, just loose wings. I remember those loose wings laying there over ankle deep stacked against the tree with pig's blood still running down its bark. My grandmother came for me that night. I spent most of the day crying, I remember, just waiting for her. I never went back after that. Never. Not once in almost 20 years. I'm horrified of that place, utterly mortified. My grandfather died two years ago, three in January. He gave me the property. I think I'm supposed to go back there. I think I'm supposed to go there and look after whatever came looking for him that night. Anyone with any advice is more than welcome. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest. And my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we would walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from, a camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous, and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night, we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun, we did it multiple times and never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid 90s, it worked out we were both in town for about a week or two. We'd do this stuff with family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand by me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are one hell of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night and walk home. The day came. We started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off at our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought it was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction just to be adventurous. We knew the land well. We had a map, so I said, what the hell? And we set off. The day went fine. 
It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we bought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk around a little bit, just to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over the hill, and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods, and up a small incline, and figured if we didn't see anything from the top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was in fact, an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building, whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stirred atop of the place, also withered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews, and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was simply an abandoned church. We left immediately, and went back up the hill to our spot where we had picked a camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness of seeing a church in the middle of the woods. Besides, at this point it was dusk, and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep, and move out early next morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and got talking, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little bit like this. Do you hear that? What was that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so that you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was nearly pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got up to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered. And though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there but we only saw the occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field's length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared me. 
It sounded like some Old Testament preacher, the kind you see in movies. But again, it was like he was speaking a different language, as I couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something and then the bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get out of here. When Joe puts a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well. But what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see them holding flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move towards us and the hill. We booked it down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. And after a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came by a road. By our small map, we knew that our town was about 15 minutes down the road, and we walked there. We got to the 24 hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing with us. But I heard those voices. And they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were. But it was definitely the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me out in the woods. I've had run-ins with cougars at an old farmhouse we lived at for a while. You could always tell because the nightlife would go silent, the bats would vanish, the foxes would go silent, even the tree frogs and crickets would be quiet. It started with nearby cows going out. Then it was like a blob of audible darkness as everything hid from the big cat. Now here's a creepier story. The same thing happens when a big feral hog is wandering solo at night. Same place. We let our dogs run loose at the night for exercise. Sometimes they came home with a raccoon or armadillo. This one particular night, they came home hauling full tilt boogie on the back porch. My dogs fear nothing because they're dumb. So when they run from something, I step inside for a handgun. So when they run from something, I know it's bad, and I head inside for protection. The dogs were emboldened. So with my wife behind me and our dogs scouting ahead, where the dogs are barking like they see something, it was the opposite. It was stuck under the chain link fence. Pig squash. It was the size of a bass boat. I grunted, and my old dog took off the porch. I told my wife to head for the house, and I would be there soon. The hog had uprooted the concrete set posts. It was looking at me, and I was looking at Ham. I backed away, and one step at a time, if I tripped, he would have eaten me, like I eat Ham. When I got to the porch, my wife had my weapon ready, and I told her to keep it for when I was MIA. I know what you're thinking, and you're right. Nothing happened because the pig was long gone. The next day I went to try and estimate the damage to the fence. But the only sign of the hog was a bunch of bristle and a trashed fence. Some things in life you just wish you could forget ever happened. Like one cold night in England around the time of my 20th birthday. It was September. Then I was going through a lot of changes in my life, including a painful breakup. To avoid just smoking around my room, I decided to get out for a while. But I didn't want to go to my usual place because it reminded me too much of my ex girlfriend. So I decided instead to visit the lake my grandfather runs. It's about the same distance, 
but it felt strange going the opposite direction to what I was used to. Upon entering the lake via the tour gates, my grandfather had provided me with a key to unlock. I became aware that I was completely alone here, which is not something I had counted on. I assumed that there would be fishermen, swimmers, but there wasn't a soul in sight. As this particular night was a Sunday afternoon, and the lake was closed for business. Now, aware that my grandfather had provided me with a key for the gate and not wanting to return home, I decided to explore the woods on my own. I began my journey through the trees, not wanting to go near the lake as the sky darkened. It began to blacken the water surface. The sight of that huge lake on the verge of freezing filled me with dread. It was foolish of me to start this late in the day, but waking up so late and not leaving the house had made me completely lose track of how fast it gets dark this time of year. After 15 minutes of walking, I turned right back around and walked the way I came, or at least I thought I did. But over 20 minutes later, as I realized something had gone drastically wrong, as I was looking around for the green gates which I had previously entered, and they were nowhere in sight. Thoughts raced through my mind, like the fact that I might just be spending the night in here. Lost and terrified in the woods, I ran. My heart pounded, and the sky became alarmingly dark. My family were going to wonder why I wasn't home. It was all too much, and I was forced to do the one thing I didn't want to do in the world. Sit on a dead tree log in the middle of this dark and unfamiliar forest. I waited there and composed myself. It became clear to me that my best chance was to find the path. So I began to set off in a random direction. When all of a sudden, I heard the unmistakable sound of twigs snapping behind me. I whipped back and what I saw without a doubt was the most terrific sight I've ever laid eyes on. Where I had been just moments before, sat a man. His rigid arms stuck out shockingly to the sides. It was impossible to tell whether he was clothed or not, as his entire body was caked in a thick white powder. His hair was also indistinguishable from the chalky coating. The only things visible were his eyes, which were wide open and bulging, and his mouth, which gaped open in a sickening manner. We stayed this way, perfectly still, until the scene was shattered by the man letting out a horrendous, hacking cough. Plumes of white dust exhumed from his mouth. Something inside me screamed to get the hell out of there. So I turned and ran as fast as my legs could carry me away from that horrific coughing sound. I didn't even look back, quickly finding the path and then almost immediately after the gates, which despite being tall, I climbed over instead of trying to unlock the lock. When I got home, I explained what I saw to my parents and eventually calmed down. My mother tells me that the lake, like a lot of lakes, was originally used as a quarry. And in fact, miners could have been crushed to death in cave-ins, mining chalk in the dangerous conditions of the mine. Although that was years ago now, I still have never been so scared and I will still never go back there for as long as I live. About five to six years ago, me and seven to eight other friends went to a village to attend a friend's wedding ceremony. The wedding ceremony tradition was scheduled at about 9pm. The location was about 100 kilometers from Ambedad. So we left about 6.30pm after work and managed to get there at 9.30. We were all quite hungry at that point so decided to take dinner and then attend the ceremony, as Indian wedding ceremonies generally take a while, and for the most part was probably scheduled to end at some point past 2am. It was winter, and the marriage ceremony was held on open ground. It was quite cold, 
so we decided to leave back to our town, as everyone had to go to work the next day. We had two cars, one was an SUV, and the second one was a wagon type vehicle. My friend was driving the SUV and I the wagon, keeping a safe distance. We were all aware of the scary stories surrounding this particular highway, as there are many accidents that have happened here, and people who have claimed to see paranormal things on it. After about half hour of driving on the highway, we were suddenly surrounded by trees, clearly we'd entered a forest, and the road suddenly thinned so that it was only possible for two cars to be on it at once, going in either direction. We were driving between 80 to 100, and suddenly me and my friend, who was sitting as the co-driver, saw something run from the right side of the highway and pass through the first car. The SUV shook like something hit it, though my friend who was driving didn't stop and just carried on. In a matter of seconds, we reached the exact spot, and I too slowed down the car to check what it was. Me and my friend looked from the car windows, but nothing was there. I asked my friend to call another driver who was driving the SUV. He called him up and handed me the phone. I told him to not stop the car, and we will stop at the next circle and have some tea. In 20 minutes, we reached that circle. The story doesn't end there. We started to talk about what had just happened. I asked him, so what happened? He said he didn't know, that a cat came from nowhere and hit the car. Me and my friend gave each other a strange look. Tell him what we saw. So my friend said, dude, we saw a lady run towards the car and she passed through it, but when we reached there, she was gone. A dead silence was engulfing us all. We'd looked at each other, but none of us had any explanation to what we'd just seen. What was so strange is that we saw a lady, they saw a cat. I was doing some research on Google, and it turns out the highway is said to be one of the most haunted places in Gujarat. I used to live in a fairly populated condo complex, and my condo's backyard goes on for about 10 feet, then it's a large wooded hill slash plateau. We get a lot of snow where we live, and therefore most of the trees are very hardy pine or oak trees that can take lots of water, but can also last without it for a while when it gets cold. Now that you have the context, allow me to share the story. It was late spring a few years back, and I went to explore in the woods as I usually do. It was a little muddy at the base of the hill, and the trees had grown leaves that were green and healthy. No signs of invasive bugs or animals to be seen, and it was obviously freshly rained. About two or three nights later, I woke to the sound of a loud cracking and snapping, which was horrifying on its own. Weird stuff had happened in that house. I went out the next day, and I was really confused, because all of the otherwise healthy trees were dried out, and a lot of them were snapped halfway up the trunk. Once again, these trees were girthy, but there was no signs of parasites. If you could try to help me figure this out, all answers are welcome. I honestly have no idea how otherwise healthy trees could have been torn in half and dried out a few days later. I dog sit for a family friend. They much prefer to have someone stay at the house with the dogs. I grew up in a town in the middle of nowhere, and I love the countryside. So for me, this is like a staycation, because I live in the city now, and never have any time to myself. The house is in the middle of nowhere. When I say nowhere, I mean this place takes two hours to get to from work, and is about 45 minutes to the nearest town or interstate. There is one neighbour within five miles and he lives directly across the street. I'm used to this where I'm from. It's supposed to give you the space you need, but also help you feel safer, knowing you have at least one person nearby. However, this guy has done nothing but make me feel unsafe as hell. 
So I get to Terry and John's house and they're telling me the drill. When to feed the dogs, two super cute and spoiled Australian cattle dogs and water the plants and stuff. Then as they're loading up their stuff to take to the car, Terry says, Oh, don't forget to tell her about Steve. John says, Oh yeah, don't worry about the neighbor across the street. He's harmless. The guy drinks a lot and is a little off, but totally harmless. Hell, the guy has lost his license so many times, all he can do is drive a moped round to get to town. However, just in case, this is where we keep our firearm. Steve has three, don't tread on me Confederate flags, and two plain Confederate flags, all of which are hanging from his porch. Of course, he's a little weird. Then he takes me to where the weapon is located and explains that it's loaded. And if I were to use it, I don't need to cock it, just pull the trigger extra hard. At this point, I'm like, whatever, you keep that in your house when it takes police at least 45 minutes to get here. Still, I've got no worries, I'm used to drunk weirdos. I know how to handle them. I love this life in the middle of nowhere. And I've gotten two protective dogs that will always attack on a one word command. So I feel quite safe. Terry and John leave around 3pm. I took the dogs for a walk and play some frisbee and begin to unload my stuff while they're still worn out from all the running. As I come back for my second load of stuff as I'm staying there for a week, I needed work clothes and my Xbox to keep me entertained in the late evenings. I hear their neighbor Steve slam on his door, seemingly having a phone conversation. I first just heard his voice faintly. Then he started yelling, asking where they went. The dogs are just hearing him now and starting to growl softly. I tell the dogs to calm down. It's all right, I say. Just Steve, remember? He probably wants some privacy. Let's go inside. As I grab my stuff, I hear him yell again. I do care about my kids. And then I hear him throw something on the unpaved road behind me. Turns out it was his cell phone. As I'm grabbing my stuff, the dog starts going crazy and runs a few feet behind me, barking and growling viciously. I drop my stuff, turn around and see the neighbor at the end of the driveway just staring at me. I yell at the dogs to calm down and get back to my side. They do. And then I gave Steve a friendly wave. In my head, I'm thinking, this is kind of weird, but he's probably been drinking. Plus, they said the guy's harmless, and I've dog sat before and never had a problem with neighbors. He then takes a single step towards me and says in a manipulative sounding voice, you will riot. Steve is wearing dirty jeans, work boots, and a dirty red hoodie and a red hat with the Confederate flag on it. He's also got brown, dirty hair to his shoulders and a beard that's probably five inches long. Yeah, I'm pretty good. My name's Pip. Just dog sitting for Johnny and Terry this week. I'm ready to get them all in for the evening. I look down at the dogs to see their reaction. They look like they're just about to attack and I've never seen them like this before. How about yourself? We sat in silence for about 30 seconds before he stated, I'm asking if you're all right. I'm Steve. Nice to meet you, Steve. Thanks for being a good neighbor and checking on me. But like I said, I'm good. Are you all right? This time, the silence lasts for probably a whole minute and I figure he's wasted. I should just get inside with my stuff. So I turn around, finish grabbing my things. And as I do, I hear him take one more step on the gravel driveway. The dogs bark again. I turn around and Steve says, I know them. Them dogs won't do nothing to me. There's some damn good dogs, that's for sure. I begin feeling super uneasy, so I close my trunk and turn around to see if he's going to say anything else. I was about to tell him that I was going to go inside and then instead awkwardly said, Yeah, I'm... Yeah, what? He yelled. I'm shocked and say, Yeah, I'm going inside now. Thanks for checking, Steve. I'm fine. I've got the dogs this week. Have a good night. 
I turn and go, and the dogs follow me with no problem. Steve continues to stand where I left him for 10 minutes, just staring at the house. Note, this house does not have a front door. There's a side door and a back door. The back door is the main door because the front door of the house has those big green fluffy privacy trees. So I can't even see his house through the front window. You can't see either doors from the street. You have to come onto the property to see them. It's about six o'clock. And where I'm at the sun starts going down around that time, but doesn't actually get dark until 9.15pm during the summer. The dogs and I are on the couch, and I've got my gaming headphones on while playing R2D2 online. All of a sudden, the dogs flip, running towards the back door and barking and growling. What the hell? They don't do this unless someone pulls up in their car, and they don't know who it is but I'm not having anyone over. I grab my knife, which is always located nearby, and start walking towards the back door. The dogs are still going crazy, and I have no idea what they're looking at. I don't see anything. But then, I look closer. I see moped trail lights in the driveway, seemingly hiding behind my car. I then try and focus in and see that Steve is turning around, staring at the back of his house from his moped, ducking behind my car. I get the dogs to be quiet, and I hide to see what he's doing. The dogs are still growling, but at least they're not giving away my location right now. I was watching him for five minutes. Just a creepy stare in my general direction. I don't think that he can see me, but I'm unsure. He then shuts off his moped and crouches down next to my car, where I can see him now peeking into it. When I lived in the country, you see, I didn't ever lock my doors, not for my house, not my car or anything. Since I work and live downtown, naturally I keep all of my doors locked at all times. I didn't see him try and get into it, but he walks around it a few times. He's not crouching anymore. Obviously, he feels like no one's watching him, or he doesn't care. He just is looking into my car, and is only taking a single step, stopping, looking in my car, then at the house, and repeat. It's creepy as hell. At this point, I text Terry, and tell her that Steve is doing some really weird stuff, and that I'm feeling super uncomfortable. I get a text back saying, call the cops if you feel unsafe. They know him. They can come and talk to him. Remind me to tell you about the time he was standing out at the street at 6am when I was leaving for work when we get back. We think he's had a psychotic break. How comforting, right? So I talk myself down. This guy is just wasted. However, if he starts getting close to the door, I'm calling the cops. Bad idea looking back, because the cops take so long to get out there. I'm watching him as he's made his second round looking into my car. He then gets on his moped and drives off. As he passes the window that faces the driveway, he sped up, trying to make it so that I wouldn't see him if I were just watching TV. Now it's about 8pm, and the dogs start going crazy again. I look out, and now his moped is parked in plain view, and he's standing on the walkway just 30 feet from the house, staring and talking to himself. Now it's like 8pm, and the dogs start going crazy again. I look out, and now his moped is parked in plain view, and he's standing on the walkway just 30 feet from the house, staring and talking to himself. I had previously turned all the lights off, so that he couldn't easily see in and see what I was doing. I see him take a single step towards the door, now 29 feet away. I grab the firearm. I've calmed the dogs down, and they are in full-on protective mode. One dog to my left and one to my right. It's now 8.15pm, and I call the cops. I explain the situation, and that the owners think he had a psychotic breakdown. 
As I'm halfway through explaining why I'm starting to fear for my safety, the operator says, Ma'am, what's your address again? I tell her, I'm sorry, ma'am, but you're not located in our county. I'll have to transfer you to Chow County. Are you serious? The owner said that the cops in South Spoon know him very well and know how to handle him. Isn't that you guys? Yes, ma'am, that is us, but you are located in a different county. That's not our jurisdiction. The guy who is bothering me lives in your county. That is why I'm calling you. The operator then transfers me to another county. When she answers the phone with the average, 911, what's your emergency? I'm silent. I'm looking out the kitchen window and Steve has come up about four to five feet since the last time I looked out there. 911, what's your emergency? I then explain what's happening and explain that I was transferred because I'm apparently not in their jurisdiction. She tells me to remain calm, to turn all the lights on and I said, screw that. The guy's waiting for me to do something like that. The doors are locked and I have a firearm. If he enters, I will shoot. She then tells me that it's safest with the lights on. I turn on the lights, he notices, and gets on his moped and drives back to his house. I tell her what happened. She asks if I would still like to have an officer come out. Hell yes, I want one to come out. Apparently the cops in the neighboring jurisdiction know him, but the lady transferred me to you. This is the third time he's come onto the property and he's getting closer and closer to the door. I do not feel safe. Someone that is not me needs to talk to this guy. Calm down, ma'am. We'll send someone. However, based on your location, it may take a while for someone to get out there. That's fine, I say. Just please, have someone out here as quickly as you can. I ask her if she would stay on the line until he got here. And she says that one's on their way, but she needs to be available if someone else calls in. She told me that if he comes back and I'm uneasy to call them without hesitation. By this point, it's now nine. The sun is getting ready to set completely. Again, the dogs go crazy. And now I'm getting really pissed off from walking around the house with a loaded weapon so that if Steve sees me, he'll see the firearm as well. I look out the window and see his moped, but I don't see him. Where is he? From the window in the kitchen, I can't see the back door. So I go upstairs with one dog following. The other is too old to climb the stairs and peek through the window. Steve is on the back porch, lighting matches and throwing them down onto the wooden porch. He doesn't seem harmless anymore. He's talking to himself and twisting his head back and forth like he's getting warmed up for a fight or having a conversation with another one of his personalities. I start filming him from the upstairs window just in case so that I can hide my phone and when they found it, they know who they'd be looking for. The sun is down and it starts to get dark. He steps up the door and begins to knock. He then starts pounding on the door and I'm pretty good at staying calm in this situation, but my heart is beating so fast my Fitbit had to change my heart rate tab every two seconds. If he gets in here, I'm going to have to use this firearm. I could see pure hate in his eyes. He then stops pounding at the door, quickly turns away and runs to his moped, starts it and takes off faster than I thought the moped could go. Not a minute later, the cop pulls into the driveway. I had mentioned to the dispatch operator that I have two dogs who will bark at the officer but will not attack unless given a specific word. They are trained and that I have a firearm that I will leave when I go meet the officer. I met the officer, the dogs didn't growl and simply gave a single bark apiece to let me know that someone was there. I went outside to meet him and told him the guy just took off moments ago on the moped. Oh yeah, I think I passed him when I turned onto the road. I explained that he is either drunk or crazy. And if he sees him on his way back, he should definitely pull him over because I'm quite positive he's under the influence of something. Normal people don't just act that way. The cop basically shrugs everything off and says, 
Well, are you going to stay here the night? I told him no. I leave the dogs overnight and come back in the morning. I asked him to stay while I packed everything up and he nodded. I go inside, give the dogs love and treats and crate them for the night and take off and return the next day with my dad. My dad begins walking the perimeter to try and show him that a man is also staying here. I'm a 24 year old female, by the way, if you were wondering. Then Steve wearing the same dirty outfit and hat while holding a 24 case of Budweiser is standing at the end of the driveway again. I'm watching him from the front window and I see my dad at the other end of the yard as he comes into view and Steve turns around and walks back to his house. I later learned that Steve had been to jail multiple times due to domestic abuse. His kids are not allowed to see him due to his violent nature and he bought a four wheeler. No one knows how he gets his money to these things. Terry and John have never seen him leave for work. They've only seen him leave on his moped for four wheelers empty handed for an hour or two and then return with a load of beers a while later. I don't know who he thought I was, but every time he looked at the house in my direction, there was just pure malice in his eyes. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't have called the cops as early as I did. When dog sitting from now on, if a neighbor says, hi, my answer is, let's not meet. The scariest night of my entire life was a close encounter with a later confirmed murderer when I was camping with my boyfriend in the mountains. It ended with us running for our lives down the mountain in the pitch black, clutching weapons and a hammer for self protection. It was the end of 2018, our first getaway together as a couple. We went to the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. We were naive. We thought it would be more romantic to camp out as far off the beaten track as possible. We walked really far into the wilderness and got to a spot where nobody passed us all afternoon. We were making s'mores over the campfire after it had just gotten dark as it was twilight. All of a sudden, my boyfriend who has 2020 vision saw a man approach us slowly. He was creeping up on us. At first, he thought it was a park ranger coming to tell us to put our campfire out. I began to hide the weed, thinking this was our biggest concern. So my boyfriend called out to him. Hey, can I help you? We thought it was weird he didn't have any kind of light on him. He didn't have any camping bag, nothing for camping. Why was he out here so far with no camping gear at night and no light? He sped up after my boyfriend called out and came right at him. He had this strange look in his eyes. The look was absent, blank and weird. He didn't answer and just kept walking right at him. When my boyfriend realized it wasn't a park ranger, he quickly put his hand in his pocket where he had a concealed weapon. He made it very clear that he had a weapon and it was only after my boyfriend did that this guy acknowledged us. He said, Oh, I was just wondering if y'all having a party. Remember we're miles away from a single soul. And it was beginning to get dark when he began to approach us slowly without a flashlight. He had no camping gear with him, just a tiny drawstring bag on his back. After he asked us what we were doing, we didn't give him any answers, but asked him what he was doing. He didn't answer. He just looked past my boyfriend towards the site. It was windy, so we had to put up a tarp to shield ourselves. This also meant the guy approaching couldn't see how many people were at our site. How many people you got with you? He began to circle our site to check us out. He asked again if we had any other people with us and my boyfriend didn't answer. And he carried on circling around our camp. Bear in mind, we had set up our camp on this crazy steep hill. It was the only spot for miles that was possible to put up a camp. However, he told us that he was going to set up a camp nearby. He proceeds to walk off in a direction straight up the hill. We knew for a fact he couldn't put a camp on there because of the terrain. Remember, 
He had no light with him, no camping gear, no anything. We were silent. We listened to his footsteps on the leaves as he walked up the hill in his direction, completely off the path. He walked for about 30 seconds, and then his footsteps stopped completely. He was just still, silent. We knew he was still there, but we couldn't see him. It was dark. At this point, I was freaking out. I didn't want to seem like a coward in front of my boyfriend. We had been talking about whether we needed to leave. My boyfriend handed me the utensil and said if anything happens, I should run. At this point, I knew it wasn't just me freaking out unnecessarily. He said we needed to get out of there and to just grab essential items. I was scared that this creep had plans for us with a firearm of his own. Later on, I said to my boyfriend that this is probably the type of guy that would prefer to end people's lives with a sharp object. We began to walk down the trail, running in the pitch darkness with our flashlights off. For at least a mile, my boyfriend looked back to see him staring at one point. He ran behind me to protect me. This experience stuck with me. I still can't think of a rational or non-menacing reason as to why that guy was there that night. I've tried. Now this was at the end of 2018, but my boyfriend, now husband and I, were remembering it last night. I decided to type into Google to see if there had been anything or strange happen in the same place around the same time. And there was. A few months after our incident on the same trail, an unhinged man with crazy eyes approached some hikers at twilight as it was getting dark. He behaved in a deranged and aggressive manner before stabbing a man to his end with a 17 inch weapon. A woman he was with ran for her life down the trail. Finally, she raised her hands in surrender and he began to hurt her as well. And somehow she managed to get away. That guy carried on wandering the trails and shouted out to other campers to give him a flashlight. They didn't, thank goodness. All of these details are the same guy who approached us. Same age, same deranged eyes, and same lack of a flashlight. The more articles I read, the more I realized this psycho had been roaming the hiking trails harassing hikers for a while. A few different people had reported him, not just us. Apparently, this erratic and violent guy was well known to law enforcement along the Appalachian Trail. His name is James Sovereign Jordan. We got lucky. It could have been us. I want to share with you an experience that happened to me and my brother two years ago. We were deciding to go somewhere haunted during the day. There's this cemetery in Santa Cruz that we decided to check out. We go in and walk around and there's nothing out of the ordinary that happened, so we decided to leave. The cemetery is on a supposed haunted road that leads up into the woods. This road is said to be haunted by a lady in white that tries to hitchhike into your car. I had forgotten this fact until after that day. All right. So along the road we're driving down, it leads into a forested area. A couple of miles from the cemetery, you can pull to the side of the road and walk along this hiking trail. So we decided to hike this trail because I completely forgot that the road was haunted. So I wasn't even looking for anything paranormal. We start hiking this trail in the afternoon. 10 minutes into the trail, we stumble along abandoned train tracks and a barely standing bridge for the train that used to run along those tracks. It looks cool, so we decide to down this hill right by the bridge that lets you go under the dilapidated bridge. We were going down and just messing about, looking at the cool architecture. After we had our views, we start backing up the hill that leads back to the trail. When we got to the top, we are a little exhausted because the hill is kind of steep and you have to use the trees around you as leverage to climb back up. So we're standing around on the trail when we both notice something out of the ordinary. We hear a voice 
like a grown man's voice shouting and screaming very angrily. He was absolutely full of rage. We quiet down, and I can tell the voice is very far away. Almost sounded like it was in the mountains around us. It sounded more than 500 feet away for sure. We both look at each other, asking ourselves what that was. We stand around listening for 15 seconds, and the next thing we know, the voice came down the trail from what sounded like a hundred feet away, from being right down the end of the trail. The inhuman speed the voice approached us was unnatural. I noticed it coming down the trail, and thinking to myself, this voice sounds like it's from someone who is about to end someone else's life from rage. But the weird thing is, the voice is speaking in what I can only describe as gibberish. I understood not one word it was saying. I instantly get this fight or flight feeling all in my body, because it's getting very loud and closer to us at inhuman speed. I tell my brother to pick up some very large sticks with me, and to defend ourselves, because even though the voice came out of nowhere and moved down the trail at lightning speed, I still had the assumption that it was some sort of crazy person readying to end our lives. We pick up the sticks and run down the trail back to the car. As we're running away, the voice is coming down the other end of the trail, and I hear the voice come up behind us in an instant. It sounded like he was no more than 10 feet behind us chasing us back to the car. I turn around, even though I don't want to because I have to see how close he is from us, and as I look back and heard the voice right behind me, I see no one. I tell my brother to run faster, because the voice is literally behind us yelling in absolute rage, and I see no one chasing us. We started picking up speed, and the craziest thing in my life happened. The voice starts panning around us in 360 audio. I hear it yelling in gibberish right behind me, then starts panning to my left even though the trees just off the trail, then the voice is right in front of us, then it slides to the right side of the trail and then back behind us in about 10 seconds. At this point, me and my brother are very creeped out, and ran the west of the way back to the car. The voice kept following us down the trail, and I remember after hearing the voice panning around us and hearing it reverberate through the woods. I started praying for help. After, we make it around halfway down the trail to my car, and the voice disappears. I remember slowing down exhausted, and we start talking about what exactly we had just heard. I asked my brother if he also heard the voice slide in circles around us, and he said he heard it too. At that point I knew that I wasn't hallucinating or imagining it. I asked my brother if he had heard it and how it sounded in gibberish, but like a man screaming at the top of his lungs in rage. He said he heard the same thing. We finally get into the car, and drive the hell out of there in a heartbeat. The car ride back was silent, as we were just there contemplating what happened. That's when I remembered the whole road was haunted, and not just the cemetery. I had been down that trail alone a few months before this experience, and nothing strange had happened. This was one of the weirdest things that's ever happened to me during my life. To this day, I've never been back down there and never planned to go either. Everything I have written down is the absolute truth, and nothing has been altered. The Santa Cruz area and mountains are known for cults and very dark magic to be performed on them. If you have any questions about this experience, feel free to ask. Please, stay safe out there. This encounter happened years ago. I grew up in a tiny French village in mid-northern France, in an area that is mostly well known for its massive forest. My little village was in the middle of this forest, surrounded by trees from all sides. Most of its secluded population was of an elderly demographic. The forest was large enough that if you walked in one direction, it would be hours or even days if you chose a bad trajectory, until you'd find any other proper civilization, aside from the occasional lone road. Now, don't get me wrong, the forest is lovely, and I've spent many cherished memories there, but it's also rather secluded, and I can only begin to imagine what mysterious things happen 
under the cover of so many dense twigs, branches and leaves. Every day to get to school, my mum would drive me and my sister to school in the next town over. However, on this fateful morning, we had to stop the car mere seconds after driving off. In the middle of this rather narrow and seldom used road, there was an elderly woman in her nightgown, splattered with mud and bruises, and seemingly exhausted beyond her wits. She was barefoot, her feet blackened by mud and caked with lashes of blood. She didn't flinch as the car crawled towards her, nor did she show any signs of relief as my mum stepped out of the car to greet her. She was terribly confused and didn't seem entirely sure what to say or how to begin. For a moment, she just babbled incomprehensibly. But within a few seconds, a somewhat coherent sentence started to form. She was repeating that she'd ran, ran all night, as it was roughly 7.30 in the morning in early spring, so the sun had just began to rise not too long ago. She said she'd run through the forest not knowing where to go, but as she went on it became clear that she had been trying to escape something. She paused, catching her breath and gathered her thoughts. It was clear that this was all a mess in her mind. And just now was she trying to collect everything coherently. Someone, she continued, had kept her locked up in a cellar. She didn't know where or how long or who it was, simply that they had locked her up. It was damp and muddy, she said. She didn't remember how she got out. All she knew is that it was in the dead of the forest in the dead of night. So she ran as fast as her frail body would allow. At this point, it seems like she had nothing more to say, for it seemed like her nighttime escape had culminated in us meeting her. I don't exactly remember what she and my mum discussed next, but it resulted in my mother calling the old lady's son who lived on the other side of the village. A few minutes later, he arrived and told us we should leave. Fast forward a few days, I asked my mum if she knew what became of the old lady after we left her. I'm not sure how my mum found out this next bit, but apparently a few men had broken into her house that night, beaten her up, ransacked her home, stealing some of her most expensive possessions, and she had apparently fled for cover into the forest, which was only a few meters away from her house. Now, if that isn't creepy enough, a few extra details stick out in my mind. First, when we found her in the middle of that narrow road, it turns out she was standing right next to her house. Perhaps the burglars were still in her home as we spoke to her. Her sense of time did seem distorted, after all. Secondly, no mention of the supposed cellar she was being made to keep inside of. Had it been a fiction of her panic and delusion? Or had she really been locked up somewhere in the forest, only for no one to believe her? It seems unlikely, but you do occasionally stumble on old and grotty stone huts and ruins in the forest. Perhaps one of them had a few gruesome tales to share. Unfortunately, we never spoke to that family again, so we never did find out what really happened that night. I believe the elderly lady has now passed on. We will never fully find out the truth about that cellar. But nonetheless, whenever I return home and drive past that house on the narrow street, I can't help but remember the frail lady standing alone in her muddy nightgown. I staffed a summer camp for five years now. A long-standing tradition is that some of the senior staffers regularly sneak out during the night and drive into town to hang out and generally be hooligans. Me and four other guys pushed a car around the bend from the parking lot to avoid waking up the adults, then hopped inside and headed down towards the town. After a few hours of jokes, Baha blasts from Taco Bell, and teaching one of our goons how to drive in an empty parking lot, we're driving down the country roads, joking around and listening to music. That is until we turned down a random road and something immediately feels off. It's about 3.30am, and we start down a hill, 
and suddenly the road goes from asphalt to gravel to dirt. We then notice a rusted boat trailer on its side, a bunch of old tools, rotting piles of wood, and a general mess. That's when we reach the bottom of the hill. There's a big shed with a garage door that's wide open, and another shed seemingly made out of plywood with a door creaked open. There's a light shining through the crack of the door faintly, flickering, and a fuse box right outside the door. The mood of the car changed in an instant. For a moment, we all sat in silence watching the lights flicker. No one said anything, but we could all tell something didn't feel right. Eventually, to ease the tension that we're all feeling, we start to joke, as teenage boys do, jeering at one of our friends to turn off the light or open the door, when suddenly the door creaks open. The next few moments are a blur, but I can assure you that was the fastest an early 2000s Toyota Camry has ever booked it up a dirt road. All five of us stayed just about silent during the 15 minute drive back to camp. Something about the aura of the place felt off. To this day, when I imagine sitting in the front seat of that car, I get an uneasy feeling in my stomach. Was someone behind the door? Why were they there at 3.30 in the morning? I grew up and lived in rural New England most of my life, which meant that when I was in high school, if my friends and I wanted to go see a movie, we had to drive about 45 minutes. Well, one night, my buddy and I decided to go see a movie, some action flip like Judge Dredd or Captain America. And on the way back home, I decided to take the back roads so that I could drive a little faster. Now, Back roads in Vermont are a lot of fun and scary as hell if you don't know what you're doing. They're almost like one lane dirt roads, cutting through miles of endless mountain and forest with a house about every five miles or so if you're lucky. So we're on one of these roads, the radio is playing some rock and roll and it's snowing, not lightly snowing or crazy amounts of snowing, just a soft, pleasant snowfall. And we're about halfway home deep in the woods and we come to this hill, and at the top of the hill, it curves. So it's a blind hill in the middle of the woods, and it's snowing. So I slowed down significantly. We round the corner, and my headlights lit up this spot on the side of the road, where the snow wasn't falling, more like hovering in midair. There was also a person standing there, and the snow was building up on their shoulders and head and it stayed that way long enough for me to register everything that was going on. And then the snow build up all sort of collapses. And it looked like everything else that I had just driven past. Well, I continue driving for a while in silence trying to make sense of what I would just seen to see if I can find a rational explanation. I then turned to my friend. Did you see that? Oh, thank God. I thought I was hallucinating, he replied. So we described what we saw, and we saw the same thing. And then we turned around and drove back up and down the road really slowly to see if we could see it again, or find a reason as to why that might have happened. And there was nothing. My parents had a business running cabins in the middle of nowhere. People would rent them out for a small amount of time and then leave. It was their job to make sure that they were cleaned and ready for the next people, to market them and have people come and stay every once in a while. It was quite far to the nearest town, at least a 40 minute drive every day to and from school and for groceries and the like. But my parents loved being out there. I was an only child at the time as they simply were far too busy with their business to even entertain the possibility of giving me a sibling, which now in later years, I can respect having a child of my own. It was here, out in the middle of nowhere, where my love for nature grew. There were so many interesting things to see. And my parents being far too busy to pay me the attention I needed to as a growing child, 
let me wander off by myself, with only a handful of rules to adhere to. Don't be back too late, which was never specific but usually meant before sundown, to make sure I was there for dinner, amongst a few other smaller things. There was a part of the forest that I absolutely loved going to. It was a trail that I had made myself, worn it down with my own footfalls, and I tried to keep it as hidden as possible. It was my own private slice of heaven, my tranquility, my peace, and although my parents knew about it, they hardly ever went there, unless perhaps they needed to find me urgently. It was on one of these days where I made my way down the trail. I had started to build myself a little den from sticks. It was quite hard to find the appropriate sticks, and at 12 years old, I wasn't a master builder. But I did enjoy trying to gather up whatever I could to make a wannabe shelter, just so that I could read my books, or listen to music in peace, or perhaps just listen to the sounds of nature, look around and watch the animals undisturbed. It was on a day like this, the middle of summer, and prime time for rentals, that I was just chilling on my lawn chair and my den in the middle of nowhere. That's when I hear rustling up on my trail. I look around and see a man, fat, bearded, very, very tall, stumble his way through the trail. He let out a sharp cry of pain as he pricked himself on one of the brambles coming through. You see, my path was ideal for someone of my height and stature, but for a taller person there are parts that were a little bit uncomfortable. As he approached me, he asked me what I was doing there. He had a tone in his voice that almost made him sound like he was the owner of these woods, and as I didn't know if it was just national property, or if it did indeed have an owner, I started to get scared. What if I wasn't allowed here anymore? I asked him who he was, and he said that he indeed did own this part of the forest. He looked at me up and down and asked what I was doing there. I told him that I was sorry, and that I just liked coming here. I didn't want him to think that I was doing anything bad like building a den on his property. So when he looked down at the bundle of sticks, he asked what I was trying to do. And I told him that I was trying to build a little den. He laughed, and the conversation got a bit more lighthearted. He said that when he was younger, he also liked building dens out in the forest. I asked if I could keep trying to build mine, and he gave me a little nod and said it would be okay. That's when things got a bit creepy. He put a condition. He said, how about you let me play with you now, and then you can keep coming back to your den. No problem, no questions asked. I didn't really understand what he meant. I assumed just play together building the den, so I shyly nodded, but I was getting very scared. Part of me just wanted to bolt and run, but I wanted to keep coming here, and I was torn. I look up into his eyes, and I'll never forget. There was a hungry look in them, almost predator-like, like I was his prey and he was tracking me down, ready to devour me. All of a sudden, a surge of fear shot through me. He said, getting closer towards me, that he really enjoyed playing with little girls. At that moment, my heart stopped beating, and I knew I needed to leave. I bolted without another word, abandoning my lawn chair and a handful of other things I had littered about, and just ran for it. It took me about seven minutes to get back home, which was a lot faster than the usual 14-15 minutes it took to get there in the first place. I arrived through the door, panting and babbling to my mum. She calmed me down after about 10 minutes, and I finally asked her if the forest belonged to someone. She said that the forest was part of the cabin site, 
and that anyone could go through there as it was owned by my parents and came as part of the business. I was relieved and then said, so who's the man who said he owned the woods? She gave me a confused look and asked me what he looked like. I described him in great detail down to the dirty green plaid shirt he was wearing. That's when my mother got a very strange look on her face and walked away, telling me, I'll be right back, honey, just wait here, okay? She went to get my dad, who was cleaning one of the other properties, preparing it for rentals later in the day. They had a conversation and came back. My dad asked me to confirm if it was indeed the guy who I was telling her about, and I said it was. They looked at each other and told me not to worry about it, smiled, and that was the end of that. I never saw the man again, and I was very grateful for that. But part of me always wondered who he was. Sadly, I was too scared to go back into the forest for about two years, and after that, I finally made my way through again. I had to make my trail once more, and as I was getting older, my interest started to dwindle being outside, and I began focusing more on hanging out with my friends. But I still used it every now and again, just to chill, or maybe to go there with my buddies. However, this story does have a resolution. It wasn't until years later, where the spot had finally become a nice little chill place for when my friends were around, that we were all telling each other scary stories. My best friend, Ashley, was telling me about something spooky that had happened to her. And that's when, being at the exact spot where it had all occurred about eight years ago, do I tell her and the rest of my friends my story with the creep right where they're sitting. They all look aghast and ask what he looked like. I give them a brief description and one of them says, could it really be? And then cuts off. She says she doesn't remember his name but later that evening goes back to her house and gets on the internet and shows me a picture the next day. This was when cell phones were just coming out and sending picture messages had to be done through text and cost a fair amount of money on your phone operator back then. When the picture comes through, I can confirm it was indeed the man. She'd been doing some research online and it turns out that he was a predator who stalked our area and neighboring towns a number of years ago. He was convicted after he was found guilty of doing something terrible with a young child. And after that was sent to prison. I can't believe how close I was, how in danger I was that one time. In any case, I'd rather not meet him again. A number of years back, me and my girlfriend decided to go camping in the nearby woods. These woods are fairly large, and we had made it our habit every weekend to go out and explore for our exercise. But on this occasion, we opted to stay out a little bit until after dark. So we packed our gear in the morning and made a fun hike to a local creek in the middle of these woods. It was very remote and we were the only people there. I wasn't sure about camping laws, but my girlfriend said we'd be fine. So we set up our tent and tried to settle in for the evening. We would brought a portable power bank and fortunately there was still signal in the area as I had a lot of scrolling to do through all my social media apps. It was getting late around 10 PM. The sun had already set and I was just waiting to go to bed in our little sleeping bag. As we snuggle in and turn off our little lamp, I'm finding it very hard to sleep on the admittedly quite uncomfortable floor. My girlfriend has no trouble sleeping, and when she's out, she's like a rock. I lie there tossing and turning, trying not to disturb her, and after a while, I get hot and frustrated, unzip myself, and walk outside in the dark, 
thinking that I just need to calm down and cool off before I can get to sleep. But that's when I hear something strange. I hear what sounds like children's laughter in the far away distance. I look around and I see nothing. It's pitch black. There can't be any children here, I think to myself. So I peer my eyes even further into the darkness to see if I can spot any lights far away that would account for this creepy noise. There's nothing. Now feeling more anxious and awake than before, I resolve to not go back in, but to have a poke around and see where this sound is coming from. Aside from being creepy, isn't it very unsafe for young kids to be playing in the dark at night in the middle of the woods? Of course it is. So I make my way over to where the sound is coming from. But the closer I think I get, the further away it still remains. After a while, there is complete silence, and I stop dead in my tracks. Something told me not to move. It was quite dark this night. Had I moved another few steps or so, I would have fallen down a hole that I had previously not seen. It was like a ditch where trees didn't grow. It was strange, perhaps an ancient riverbed. Nonetheless, had the voices in the woods guided me to this spot attempting to push my fate, attempting to make me fall? I don't think I'll ever know for sure. All that I do know is that I made it back to the tent, didn't sleep a wink, and in the morning convinced my girlfriend to take us home. I never explained why, but she understood from my look, but she understood from my look that it terrified me to my core. Some things are best left unsaid. To start off, I work as a camp counselor during the summer. Last year during the summer, I had always heard of this out tripping area. That was three creek crossings downstream from where we would be always hanging out, or take campus to cool off on a hot summer's day. This out tripping spot was pretty famous due to a supposed abandoned meth lab trailer with an old porcelain bathtub pretty close by with some burnt up clothes inside of it. About a five minute hike deep into the woods, there's an old tag along trailer covered in bullet holes. It just screams meth lab. Now, as the adventurous person that I am, I had been meaning to go and explore the area since my last summer, which unfortunately didn't happen. Though different events occurred last summer, which I'll explain later. Nothing of this helped with the adventure I had always been meaning to go on. That is, up until this summer. For a bit of background first, the camp is based off an old abandoned ranger station deep in the woods. I won't expose too much about the camp and make it obvious of its location. The old ranger supposedly died in the situation over a hundred years ago and now haunts the camp, although he's considered to be friendly and sometimes just likes having his presence known. He protects the camp as any forest ranger now a days would. There's official papers confirming this ranger was real, or so I've been told. I for one have never seen them. Our camp director is very spiritual. They've smudged just about everywhere possible to have brought countless priests to bless the camp. They've worked very hard to get the camp to the level of safety it's at now. They have my respect. Every week we have an opening and closing campfire. This place is sacred and one of the most special areas of camp that emits nothing but safe energy. It feels like an air bubble or dome of protection. Last summer, me being stupid, myself and three others played with a Ouija board. It took a while, but eventually we got through and it said stuff like it wanted to end one of the boys playing on the board with us. We were safe because it couldn't come onto the camp and mostly only responded to me. When asked if it liked me, it responded with 666. I don't understand what that means. 
Across the camp is an area that we call Grassland Grove. Over the years, we've built up stories about the Grassland Ghost, which started out with a man who hiked the area of the grasslands before there was a trail set in place. The hiker had gotten lost off road and eventually passed. Because this was such a lonely and terrible passing, its ghost is very angry and upset and miserable and gives off bad energy. Now, of course, when people go off into the woods at night or farm out for trips and freaky stuff happens, a lot of it gets blamed on the grassland ghost. It could just be animals and creaky trees making noises and your mind playing tricks on you. Because again, no one knows what's out in the deep, dark woods. But others say it is the grassland ghost, as it likes to feed off your nervous and scared energy. I personally believe the latter, due to my own experiences. It's now time for the real story though. About midway through the summer, I was working in kitchen with one of my good friends. This week, somewhere in the middle, we finished washing the dishes from the earlier lunchtime meal. We had about three hours to kill before we had to be back at four to start prepping for dinner. Then an idea popped into my head. I asked my friend if they wanted to go to the famous meth lab outing trip spot, as I had mentioned earlier. They agreed. However, none of us knew how to get there. No one ever visited that spot anymore due to a government weather station and oil pipeline placed nearby, and also due to its general creepiness. However, I had been told directions by the older workers who had been there many years ago. I was warned not to go, but due to curiosity, I didn't care. I did get scared very easily, but that didn't stop me as I've always been intrigued by paranormal or abandoned stuff. So we grabbed some bear spray, a backpack, our water bottles, and set down towards the everyday used creek. Three creek crossings later, we were a little lost. I was looking for the pathway for this place, until I finally spotted not too far. We hiked up to the old path and made our way through the trees. Next, we came into a clearing that looked like it had been used to drive through with a truck many years ago maybe even not too long ago. All I could tell was that it wasn't used recently. We kept trekking on and found the government weather station through the field. The truck traps kept going, and I knew it was the right way. At the end of the field, the tree started up again and grew up in front of the trucked pathway. There was no way a vehicle could have been able to go past this area since the trees were blocking it out. It was at this area that things began to get creepy and eerie. Things became silent, and the grass taller, and the barbed wire fence next to us, old and out of use. At least we think. My friend had been playing music through their speakers to help with the journey and keep our spirits up. We kept walking down the path. The best way I can describe it? When there are electrical towers that run through the woods, and all the trees have been cleared up in a straight line and pathway, if that makes sense. But this was smaller and closer together, just slightly bigger than the width of a truck. Throughout this certain part of the walk, it was very offsetting and only got worse as you got deeper into the bush. The only energy I got from this was something bad, but us being silly teens, we pushed on. We reached the end of the trucking pathway and came to what I would call an extremely small ridge, almost nearly in front of you. The pathway continued downwards, though it was not extremely obvious to see. If you look to your right, another pathway started to go off that way. I walked up closer to the ridge to get a nice view. It was here I noticed some extremely old patches and a blue ground tarp looking around. We saw chopped up wood pieces and a clearing. My friend just wanted to head back to camp and being a bit nervous, stayed put about 10 feet behind me. In this clearing was a very obvious fire pit with charcoal and large stones around it. I touched the pit and I could tell it had not been used in a long time, maybe a week. 
Unfortunately, my friend and I were running out of time to explore, and we had to turn around and head back for our kitchen duties. As we stepped back into camp and finally felt safe, my friend told me something eerie. When we reached the eerie part of the pathway, just after the field, they heard a man's voice yelling or calling out after us. They just ignored it and turned the music up. I didn't hear anything. However, I wasn't content with the search. I needed more answers and vowed to return later that night. Night fell and all the campers were asleep. And it was now technically camp workers free time, except for those monitoring the kids. Now, the woods are much scarier at night. And we wanted to bring more people this time, not a big group, not a small group, just enough for an adventure. Four seemed like an adequate number. We invited another person working in the kitchen with us as well as someone who had kids this week. I trusted this boy very much. And despite his young age, he had been around a bit more in life than the rest of us had. After telling the two new ones about our earlier adventure, and how we hadn't found much else, we set off in search of finding whatever was beyond where we stopped. We continued back and where the pathway split up. The one going downwards was not prominent and obvious at the time. So we went and headed off on the pathway that went right. The pathway got smaller and smaller as we kept going. After the side were many old setup shelter bases called lean tos, just the bases as the skeleton or frame. We kept going thinking we were on the right path. It wasn't as eerie as the start of the pathway by the field, but it was still creepy. The pathway eventually led to a dead end. And as we turned into something that looked like a game trail that literally disappeared, we turned around and headed back to the start, as in where our fireplace was, and where the paths forked. We went down the not so obvious downwards pathway that led us to success. After five minutes of walking through some broken trees that gave off Blair witch vibes, we finally reached the tag along trailer and got excited due to our success and approached it to explore. It was quite old and had been completely obliterated with bullet holes. The exit holes were huge on the other side and had a literal gum practicing target sheet taped to it. Many of you wonder how it got there. Why and how? On the inside was one of those grey foldable tables that you'll find at a party to play cup pong on. Easing up our tension, we also found a little frog. Thinking we hadn't found the bathtub and meth lab yet, we continued on. We went around fallen trees and crossed a small creek and found a prominent but extremely old looking dirt trail past this. About 10 steps on this path, we looked at our clock and it was 10pm, though we had until 11 to explore. We decided to be safe and turn around and head back to camp before it got super dark, as none of us wanted to be out into the woods that late at night, with whatever was out there. That was the furthest I'd ever been out. I didn't go back to that certain point again. Nothing exactly scary happened on this trip, but it was good to explore. During the summer, there are eight weeks that a camper can come. This occurred during week four, the last week of July. We're now going to forward to week eight, the last week of the story. Since then, I'd been curious of that spot and what lied beyond it. I didn't receive another chance to return as the days began to get darker and the nights set on earlier and most people refused to go there due to its bad energy. It wasn't until week eight that I made the return journey. This week I was back in the kitchen. In the middle of the week, the three other kitchen members and I were out at the creek chilling during the day, swimming and salamandering downstream with some kids' life-size jackets on, just messing around and cooling off. We eventually floated down three creek crossing downstream until the final spot you have to cross to get to that wretched meth lab pit. Now this was the edge of the forest or the park's forest. It was fenced beyond this. The four of us were just chilling on the rocks by the water 
when I was looking around and observing the area. If you were facing the creek downstream, the outtripping spot to hike to was to your right. I looked up beyond the hill that was on the left and noticed a clearing on the trees when suddenly a thought popped in my mind. Could this have been the road the trailer got off of from the main road to get to this odd spot? Everything lined up. One of the others and I got up and went to explore ducking beneath the fence. The two others stayed there and were still just chilling. Now, what happened here I'm still trying to explain. I'm still trying to wrap what happened around my mind. The best way I could describe it is we entered a time warp or twilight zone. The two of us got near the road. I wanted answers, especially from my last adventure and needed to piece all the knowledge and evidence I had in my mind. We both were at the bottom of the road before it reached the shallow creek water. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe it was the call of the void. I was so curious for answers. The urge to explore overcame me as I ran up this loose gravel road while my friend simply just walked up. I ran ahead of her past where she could have seen me. At the top, there was a pathway that seemed to have come from nowhere that led to nowhere, but I was right. This secret road came off the main road. I didn't have enough time to dig deeper. I turned around and I heard my friend call my name once before. She seemed far away and just coming up to the middle of the road, I answered and she did not answer back. Thinking we were leaving as it was time to go, I went back down the road to see the other two who were just chilling begin to pack up and leave back towards camp. I yelled over to them if my friend was with them, which they didn't respond. They couldn't hear me. Thinking she was, I began to walk back. Way behind me, I heard yelling, but I couldn't make out what was being said. I yelled back and got no answer. I was facing the road that was a few feet in front of me and saw my friend come down the road thinking I had been hiding and pranking her. I had not. I was confused and so was she. She told me she went up the road and had called my name about three times and heard no answer. She heard me call out the first time and continued up the pathway to see if I was there, but I was gone. Only a few seconds later, she heard me calling her name again, but this time I was in a much different location at the bottom of the road. She had thought I left her to head back. Now here's what I think happened. I think we entered some dimensional time warp. This may not sound offsetting, but if you think about it, we would have seen each other as she was coming up to look for me. And as I was heading back down to leave, both of us felt like we were there for an hour when in reality it was only five minutes and we both swear we weren't pranking each other. I don't know what happened here, but all I know is that it was strange. We went back and spoke about it to the older staff and they agreed it was off putting. None of us thought we were making it up. Next night, I brought a group of people to head over to our tripping spot, as this was our last week and last chance to do so. The only one who I had gone with before was the boy, as I had felt the need that he should be brought along. For the most part, it was a group of seven who mostly just wanted to mess around. We hiked over the offsetting path beyond the field and began yelling and screaming songs to ease up the tension. One of the people who came with us had experienced this outtripping spot when it was still in use. His name was Jay. We came to the fork in the pathway and the experienced one stopped in his tracks. By the fireplace was where the old meth lab should have been, but it was just gone. Till where did it go? And how could it have just disappeared? We still didn't know. It was too dark and we didn't have enough time to carry on exploring. So we turned back on this eerie path. Perhaps one of the silliest decision makers of the group ran ahead making scary noises or animal noises and tried to hide and scare us. He did just that when we caught up to him. But just then the fence directly beside me made multiple noises and the one that was ahead of us to scare us saw something four feet tall jump the fence and run into the woods. Perhaps it was a deer. 
but considering that I was sensing bad energy from it, I think otherwise. I caught it on video, the noise, not whatever it was that ran off. I had vlogged all of the experience I had every time I went to explore this area. We got back to camp, pretty freaked out. Needless to say, we didn't have any intention of going back anytime soon. This was Wednesday night. The Friday was our last night at the camp. While meal prepping for the last dinner, one of the senior staff girls walked into the kitchen. She was pretty spiritual and said she felt the urge to come into the kitchen to help. I asked her about the Twilight Zone experience to see if she could shine any light onto the situation. And she told me it was funny I asked as she had been having her own spiritual stipulations. After a big discussion about the whole summer and our experiences, she told me she sensed I was spiritual. There's no way to describe this other than being able to sense if people or things have good or bad energy. Like I said earlier, I was the only one who had sensed the bad energy at the tripping spot. Another senior staff member came in and she too was pretty spiritual and said last time she was in the area, not by the actual tripping out spot, but at the point where you would have had to creep cross three times, she sensed something was wrong and had all the kids make their tops face away from that direction of the meth lab bus out tripping spot. This happened to have been the night I was playing with the Ouija board the past summer. After this discussion, I felt the need to go up to the special campfire spot to think about life and be engulfed with good energy. Once up there, I found Jay creating the firewood pile that would be used for that night's closing campfire. I agreed and went off to find sticks. The forest was pretty soft with moss as I'd taken my shoes off. And if you walked carefully, you wouldn't get hurt. I went up and grabbed some sticks near the hill where it went up and saw a somewhat mini pathway. I followed it and kept losing it at some point, but eventually it led to a normal pathway, nothing like a dirt hiking pathway. But when you walk through tall grass for a while with long people and it creates a trail, something like that. I kept following it until I got the very top of the steep hill and followed it until it led to a clearing. The pathway did keep going beyond this and I knew for a fact it hadn't been used in a really long time and I had no idea where it went or led to, but I had the urge to stop there and I yelled out asking for answers and saying I was here and if life wanted to tell me something now was its chance. I sat down and nothing happened. A few minutes passed, so I got up and started to return. Heading back down was painful as there were sticks dug into my feet that I'd somehow didn't feel the first time. But I felt like, not like I was being followed, but as if something was there in my presence. I'm still not sure what it was. I found old blue electrical wiring in the ground and tried to pull it out. I don't know how it got there considering we're in the middle of the woods with nothing around us except a hiking trail. And I gave up and went back down and back to the camp for dinner. And this is where the story ends. Nothing happened after this. I still feel the need to get answers. We deep cleaned the camp the next day and all campers went home. And I drove off with three others to drop them off at their homes. As I drove by where the secret meth lab road turn off, where I experienced the time warp, I said out loud that something bad was gonna happen. I just got more uneasy and felt bad vibes as I got closer to it. But once we passed it, everything felt fine. I've been told before that those who seek will not find, so perhaps that's why I never got the answers while exploring the pathways beyond the campfire. When I was young, my parents told me not to go into the woods behind my house, that they were dangerous, that there were wild animals that could hurt me, and to always stay within the garden. There was a small fence that kept our property separate from the woods, and I, for the most part, did what I was told. But being a curious seven-year-old, one day curiosity got the better of me. I remember my father was cooking in the kitchen, and my mother must have been doing something upstairs, I don't remember what. And curiosity got the better of me. I opened up the fence and made my way across just to have a peek into the woods. I told myself I wouldn't take long and that I'd be back in a jiffy before my parents noticed. 
The woods were quite cool. From my bedroom, I could see fairly far into them, but there were parts that I'd never seen before. The further I got, the more interested I became. I was getting very curious. Then I saw something shiny on the floor ahead of me. I went to collect it and found a coin. I think it must have been a dime. And I was very pleased as a seven year old to have such a large amount of currency. In my young brain, I told myself there must be more money scattered about. So I kept on looking. And that is where my downfall happened. While I was looking around, I failed to realize a tree root conveniently popping out of the ground. I tripped over it and tumbled deep into a ditch. I must have been at least five feet deep. And I was tangled between leaves and rocks. My arm hurt like hell. And I started to scream. I tried to move, but my arm was in so much pain. I can't even begin to describe how hurt I was. I managed to somehow stumble to my feet. And that's when I realized that without two functioning arms, there was no way I was going to get out of this hole. It was very deep. And I was screwed. I start screaming out for what felt like hours. Finally, just before dark, do I hear my parents calling my name? I shout at them that I was here. And my parents instead of scolding me for going into the woods, just picked me up out of the hole. My dad had to jump in first and took me to the nearest hospital. Turns out I'd fractured my arm in a couple of different places. I'd also hurt my back significantly, which is something I didn't notice and had an assortment of small cuts and bruises on many other places across my body. The doctors said that they were very lucky to have found me when they did, as staying there overnight could have rapidly deteriorated my condition. In any case, I realized that maybe I shouldn't have gone out exploring in the woods. And I didn't go out there again, until I was about 15, angsty, and needed a place to vent. But I never went as far as I did that first time. Please keep an eye on your kids, people. My life could have ended up a whole lot different if my parents hadn't have found me. I was hanging out with a guy once in my small rural town. One of the only things to do in this town are to listen to music, drive around old country roads and eventually find a quiet spot where you can park and chat. We call this road riding. And everyone does it. We were driving down a one lane road when we turned into some gravel road. The gravel eventually gave way to dirt until the dirt was just two tire tracks winding down the wood ahead of us. I asked him if he knew where he was going. And he assured me that he's been going to this spot for years. He was a really creative guy, always writing songs, recording whatever projects were on his hand. Anyway, we were sitting in his car, just having a good time. And we reach the middle of this clearing. At this point, you can't even see semblance of a road. We were truly in the middle of nowhere. Once we park, he turns down the music and gets to talking. What started out as talking about life and love eventually turned into discussing higher powers and enlightenment. There's more, but it's been almost a year now and I honestly can't recall the entire conversation. He was talking about how limited most people are in their thinking and how he thinks there's so much more out there than what we've come across. Bear in mind, it was about one or 2am at this point, pitch black outside, and we had turned off all the headlights and the only light was coming from the dimly lit radio softly playing in the background. As he's talking, I start to feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up for no reason. I wasn't particularly creeped out by what he was talking about and found it rather interesting. The air started to feel heavy. And my body became incredibly aware that we were not alone. Something was sharing that clearing with us. The atmosphere around us felt electric like something was manifesting itself. It was just a totally unnatural feeling that I've never experienced before. I felt the area succumb to overwhelming malice. 
About 30 seconds after I feel this way, he stops, looks at me and says, can you feel that? I can't even speak, so I just nod. The moment I nod, the entire clearing is lit up with a bright light. It wasn't a flashlight, like a lightning bolt. It was lit for a good five seconds before fading out. And it was steady. We stare at each other in panic, and I finally shout to him, get out of here. He fiddles with the ignition to drive away, and the whole time, I just feel impending doom. I've never felt more like I was going to perish than at that moment, and there wasn't even a visible threat. I've dealt with anxiety my entire life, so I know what it's like to feel unnecessarily helpless all the time. My fight or flight reflexes go off on all cylinders randomly through the day. This was worse. This was the scariest moment of my life. I went from being totally happy that I was sitting in a car with this super good looking dude and fighting back sobs of terror. We made it out and once we got to the main road, all he could say to me was, what was that? And my response was shake head paired with, I don't know. He dropped me off and we never spoke about it again. This is the first time I've brought it up since then and I legitimately feel terrified and clam up every time I start to tell someone about it. I feel like whatever was in that clearing with us did not want us there. It did not want to talk to us about what we were doing and it was giving us a warning. I should also mention that the radio turned off with the flash of a light and we tried to drive away and the car acted like the battery was dead for a moment before finally deciding to turn over. We hadn't been there long, so there's no way the car died as we're talking. And it seems super coincidental that it would just do that the moment the lights filled the clearing. This was a brand new car. I live in Victoria, Australia, and we don't get much snow unless you venture up into the mountain area where the climate is significantly colder. As expected, I very rarely see snow in person. So during my childhood, my mum and I would visit my papa up in Glenarchy, Victoria at least once a year. He would drive us up to a nearby mountain where we would indulge in what little snow we could play in. It was never particularly much, but we loved it. I have a distinct memory of the nausea from the bending roads and my ears getting blocked from ascending so fast. And I'll never forget the fear that our car would swerve off the narrow road and fall off the cliff. Ah, good times. It was one of these trips that my mum and I went on a small hike through a thriving forest up in the mountains. Unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the location as I was around eight to 11 years old at the time. There wasn't much snow as usual, just patches, but it was beautiful and there was no one else in sight. I can't recall why it was just the two of us at that moment. My papa did have a short term camper at the time, so possibly my mum just wanted a break from him. I remember feeling so content with our lives at that moment. Then this feeling washed over us, a feeling of impending doom and danger. It was a sinking feeling in my chest. I remember asking my mum something like, do you feel that? As we stood there bewildered. We felt like we didn't belong here, that we should leave immediately. Now, might I add that this was during the day, not at night. I had been in scouts most of my childhood and was very familiar with this type of environment. Yet here we were, frantically looking around for the source of this dread we were feeling deep in our gut. It felt like we were being watched, like a thousand judgmental eyes were gazing upon us. It was so intimidating. I remember my heart beating rapidly and my body shaking as we quickly paced back to Papa's car. There was no sound of sticks breaking, no ominous figures within the trees and no growling of monsters. This was just a feeling. I asked my mum to describe her side of the story and she remembers an image in her head of a large creature crawling up the mountain to get us. She felt as if this was in the wind, 
every big gust, it would come closer and closer. There was a nagging voice in her telling her to leave and get out over and over and getting louder the longer we were there. It was a bit dramatic, but still an interesting interpretation of the same event. Fortunately, nothing else happened that day. We made it back to the car safely and carried on with our trip. Who knows? I thought I was the only one who remembered this experience, and I just assumed it was all in my head. After all, I'm a very anxious child, and my mind could have exaggerated it. However, it was only a couple of years ago that my mum mentioned it, and I realized it did really happen. It makes me so happy, because I crave these paranormal and unexplained experiences in my life, yet I've had very little luck. Maybe it's my skeptical nature that hindered me from accepting that our world is a lot more supernatural than we perceive it. This happened fairly recently. My boyfriend and I were spending a night camping just to get away from it all. We had got comfortable in our tents and had gotten to sleep. It must have been about 4am or so and I was awoken by rustling near our tent. There aren't many big animals where we live, so I was unsure what exactly it could be. Being the curious gal I am, I glanced at my watch and knew that it had to be an animal. I didn't want it getting too close, so I thought I'd sneak my head out as I knew there was nothing dangerous in this area, just to maybe frighten it away in case it wanted to try and nibble on our tent. So I stand up, make my way out the tent and look around. There's nothing. But I listen intently in the dark. And then I hear it again. A little animal getting closer and closer. The footfalls are more pronounced. And as I look behind our tent to see where it's coming from, I hear it run off into the distance. I was quite happy with that thinking whatever it was must have seen me and gotten scared. So I pull back the flap, do the zipper back up and make my way back to my sleeping bag next to my snoring boyfriend who hadn't even noticed that I'd gotten up to scare that animal away. I try going back to sleep, but there's an uneasiness in the air now and I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. Part of me is trying to convince myself it's simply just the material and that I don't feel super comfortable sleeping like a sardine. But deep down, I know it isn't true. That encounter, despite the fact nothing happened, has unsettled me ever so slightly. And I feel that there's just something wrong. Unable to sleep, it being nearly 5am now, knowing that the light will be up soon, I decide that I'm just gonna sit out in the dark and listen to scare away anything that comes near. And hopefully by the time it's light, I feel safe enough to go back to sleep as my boyfriend is a heavy sleeper. And I know that he'll be asleep till late or so. So there I sit waiting for the first rays of light to give me comfort in the morning. But then the rustling returns, the footfalls come back, this time more rushed. I look around and still can't see anything. And when I hear nothing for about five minutes, do I finally think it's gone? But that's when I hear it. It's not right besides my tent. It's right behind me now. I quickly turn my head in a super fast way and see a man on all fours wearing dirty clothes. He almost looks like a rat. He gives me this creepy smile, stands on his legs and in an instant is running off into the woods. He hides behind a tree and starts peeking out like I hadn't noticed him, almost like this is a game. I just about soil myself and I immediately yell, Martin, to get my boyfriend's attention. He didn't wake up, so I keep on screaming. Rat man is just there in his rags staring at me hungrily from behind the tree. I wanted this creep to know that I was with someone and that if he did anything, there would be hell to pay. That's when I hear a very groggy, 
What? From my tent. And I'm getting a bit angry now. I really need his assistance. So I yell at him to come here now and that there's a strange man outside. The words seem to perk him up as he dashes outside. What I hadn't realized is that my boyfriend likes to sleep in the nude. And then there's him naked with Ratman staring from behind a tree. Not that my boyfriend seemed to notice. He was far too focused on this creep. When I point in the direction of the strange man, my boyfriend is still adjusting his eyes and can't see him yet as it's still very dark, the moon only partially illuminating where we're at. He rubs his eyes and then we hear him run again. I've lost track of him. My boyfriend is now angry, starts screaming to come here and face us like men. And then at that moment, the rat man comes running towards my boyfriend with a stick. My boyfriend just manages to avoid being smashed in the head and the rat man somehow trips. My boyfriend takes the opportunity to pin him down, punches him in the face a few times and asks him what the hell he's doing trying to scare us in the middle of the night. The rat man doesn't say anything, just spits in my boyfriend's face. My boyfriend in a fury stands up, kicks him and tells him to leave and that if he ever comes anywhere near our clearing, there'd be hell to pay. The creep slowly walked away into the distance, looking back and swearing. None of us have any idea what he was doing out here in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. We were too afraid at this point to do anything else. So we pack up our stuff and leave just as the first rays of sunshine are making their way through the dark. To this day, I still don't like camping. I'm rap man wherever you are. Let's not meet again. I was walking my boyfriend's dog a month or so ago on some trails near the beach. His dogs are both mutts, one husky chow, another a pit bull hippo. They're both loving, sweet, social and completely chill. This particular trail leads down to an estuary and starts in a state park, but there are only two parking spots at the trailhead. So it's nearly always deserted when I'm there. There is basically a main maintained trail that goes to the estuary. And then there is an unofficial trail that loops off the estuary trail. It's hard to spot and is largely overgrown, but I can tell I'm not the only one who uses it. I was walking the dogs on the main trail and just getting to the estuary where we typically stop and watch birds for a bit. When one of the dogs, the husky, starts this low growl and puffed a full mohawk. We live in an area with bears and cougars. So that's the first place my mind went. I drew my pistol just in case and started backing up the trail. I'd only taken a few steps dragging the husky away as the pit bull was still clueless and watching a squirrel when a creepy guy stepped out from behind a tree. He wasn't scary looking. He just looked like your typical outdoorsy type guy that frequented the craft breweries on every corner of Washington. He was maybe late 40s, early 50s. The tree behind him wasn't huge. He would have had to position himself deliberately to hide behind it when I was approaching. He started walking towards me smiling and growling pissed off dog like it was a bunny rabbit talking to him in a soothing voice with his hand out like he was going to pet it. The dog barked loudly and continued to growl in an unfamiliar and terrifying way. At this moment, my pit finally got her act together and looked away from her new squirrel friend. She took in the scene and got between the guy and me immediately. She didn't puff or growl as honestly, I wasn't sure what she was going to do, but her tail was out at a weird angle and she bared her teeth at him. Now, I don't know if it was her threatening looks or if the creep had caught a glimpse of my firearm that I was holding down by my side, but he suddenly dropped the amicable hiker facade and gave me this look that made my skin crawl. It was pure malice. He didn't move a step after that and didn't say anything else. It was creepy as hell. I said something along the lines of don't you come near me. And we left quickly. This time I made sure he saw my weapon as I turned around. 
When I got to the part of the trail that loops off, I took it after checking to see if he was still in sight. The dogs were super tense and on alert, and I eventually slowed down so that I could listen. And also because I'm quite large and was about to pass out from exhaustion. The loop meanders wide around the trail and is probably a quarter of a mile or so longer than the main path, which itself is maybe a mile. When I was nearing the point that the loop hit the main trail again, my good boy began to growl once more. It was super low, so thankfully the creeper didn't hear it. He was on the main trail heading back towards the estuary. As soon as he was out of sight, we booked it the last hundred yards or so off the trail to the trail head. The Subaru I had parked next to it had its hatch open. It hadn't been open when I'd gotten there. I tried to see the license plate, but couldn't since it was on the hatch, and I wasn't willing to take a second to pull it down to look. I basically threw my pit into the back of my Jeep. She's 90 pounds with the physique of a small hippo, as previously noted, and I'm pretty proud of that, and my other dog hopped up with her. I jumped in and took off, and right as I turned onto the road, my pit barked. That was the first and only time in my six months of knowing her that she's ever barked. My best guess of what happened is that as soon as I was out of sight, he started to follow me and didn't know about the other trail. He got to the trailhead ahead of me since his trail was shorter and saw my Jeep was still there. So he opened his hatch for reasons that can't have been good and headed back down the path to find me. When he heard my car door close, he raced back to the trailhead, where my very, very good girl told him what she thought of him. I swear that bark sounded like the combination of all the dirtiest words I know. It was off season, so the state park was barely manned at all by rangers. As soon as I got back on the road where there was cell signal, I called my brother who's a cop in the town the park borders. He wasn't on shift and it took a while for anyone to get out there. So creepy guy in the woods, let's not meet again.